Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and my goal is to help the military community succeed in their civilian career. Today is episode number 356, a 13-year journey to the perfect post-service career with Robin Brown. I just was completely unprepared for leaving the military. Completely, because I went in, I did college on an ROTC scholarship, so I knew when I graduated I was going into the service. Um, And so I hadn't ever uh, done the things that my roommates were doing, like how to write a resume and how to interview for a job and all the stuff, the job prep stuff, because I knew I had a job when I was going to graduate. And then I spent eight years in the service. um, And anyone that's been in the service knows that you have, you, you know, these great amounts of responsibility at a young age. And we do amazing things in the military, but then that does not translate in a resume to a civilian, um, in the civilian world at all. Today's episode originally aired one year ago. Usually when I do rebroadcasts, I like to go a lot further back than that, but Robin's episode has been on my mind a lot lately. We got a one-star review on Apple Podcasts recently after a 132 five-star review streak. The review criticized Beyond the Uniform for focusing on the 10% of veterans who are most successful in their career transition. I feel that there is some truth there. I imagine it can be frustrating, especially for those of you who are approaching a career transition or who are experiencing difficulty in your own transition, to constantly see stories of seemingly simple success. That's certainly not my intention for this show. However, one of the things I loved about my conversation with Robin is her candor in her own 13-year journey of mistakes, pitfalls, and setbacks that eventually led her to a job that she truly loves. I personally put Robin in a small category of people I've interviewed where it feels like she has found her calling in her current career path rather than simply a job. She talks about how the attributes that made her successful in the military were a liability in the civilian world, how she had to adopt her communication and response to corporate culture in order to be successful. We talk about her job in public service and why this sort of career may be fulfilling to other veterans. Additionally, Robin Brown is one of three veterans spotlighted in the 30-minute documentary, Adventure Not War. I watched it and consider myself a movie aficionado, considered it fantastic. Google it. It's also free. It's inspiring to say the least. If you like this interview, be sure to check out episode 268, How the Outdoors Saved My Life with Stacey Bear, as Stacey is featured in Adventure Not War along with Robin. As always, at beyondtheuniform.org, you'll find show notes with links to everything we discuss, as well as over 350 other episodes just like this, all provided for free. So with that, let's dive into my conversation with Robin. Joining me today in Grand Junction, Colorado, my guest is Robin Brown. Robin, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Thank you for having me. So for listeners, Robin is the Executive Director at Grand Junction Economic Partnership, which is a nonprofit organization that is your first point of contact if you are looking to expand or relocate your company to the Grand Junction, Colorado area. She served as an Army uh, in the Army as an aviation officer, flying OH-58s for eight years, where she deployed twice to Iraq, first as an AS-3, then as a company commander of an attack helicopter company. She is also a self-proclaimed army brat from an army from a family of army brats, and her husband served in the army as well as a pilot. Um, we got a hold of our uh, Robin because in episode 237, I interviewed Matt Griffin at Combat Flip Flops, an interview that Steve Bain from our team made happen. Uh, Matt and Robin were two people featured in a 25 minute minute documentary entitled Adventure Not War where she returned to Iraq to ski and heal. Uh, Steve saw the documentary and was blown away, and he did what he does best, which is get a hold of great people to talk to, and that is uh, how we're talking to Robin today. Um, so before we dive into the questions, Robin, any, any changes or additions to the bio I read about your, your background? Nope, that's pretty accurate. <laughs> awesome. Well, I, I want to spend the bulk of our time talking about your transition to post-military life but I did want to just touch briefly on, um, you know, in 2003 in Iraq, you were your helicopter was shot down, and was just curious is if you can share anything you'd like to share with the audience about that experience. 
Sure. We were, um, it was a normal day like any other day, and we went out to do a convoy security mission. And um, on our way back to our airfield, we were shot down by an SA-16 shoulder-fired missile. Uh, we survived the crash, obviously. My co-pilot and I are both still here. And um, But it was kind of a controlled crash. Um, and uh, once we were on the ground, got away from the aircraft, Ian E'd back towards uh, what we considered a safe pickup point. Um, our sister ship, we always fly in teams of two, stayed in the area and provided cover for us. We were right on the outskirts of Fallujah. And so within about 10 minutes, our aircraft was completely mobbed by crowds that had come out of the um, the city because it was really, I mean, it was smoking, big black smoke. It was on fire. So it was a pretty obvious target. And so um, we probably you need about five kilometers before our sister ship um, coordinated a rescue and two Blackhawks came in and picked us up and took us back to base. And um, it was very exciting <laughs> and still to this day is as surprising to me as it probably is to anybody listening. Um, but we were actually pretty, we were okay. We had some bruising and we were sore. We were grounded for about three days. And then out of sheer boredom, I went back and begged my commander to put us back up. So we um, continued flying for the remainder of our deployment. That's wild. <laughs> I bet that puts everything subsequent to that in, in a different perspective. perspective. Yeah, <laughs> It does. People often co comment that um, I don't get frazzled easily. <laughs> I bet. I bet. And, 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 and you're a mother of three, is it? Two. 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 I mean, two. We have a nine-year-old and a 12-year-old. Okay. I imagine there's lots of frazzling yep. moments there, but I, I imagine that uh, crazy, crazy time uh, keeps everything in perspective, even with the craziness of having kids. Um, yep. And, and your time in Iraq was featured in a book called Band of Sisters, American Women mm -hmm. at War in Iraq. For your listeners, that's um, her story is featured in Chapter 2 by Kristen Homestead. Um, can you talk just uh, about what that process was like and what it was like having this period in your life documented in that way? The um, So the 82nd Airborne Division had put um, Kirsten in, in, in touch with me. Um, she had contacted them and said, hey, I'm, I'm looking for stories of women warriors. And the book is every chapter is a different woman in the military. And so they put her in touch with me, and it was right after I'd gotten home. So in a way, it was a little bit cathartic because she came and she was actually was in was living in North Carolina. So she was near us. So she came up and spent about three days with me. And I just told the story over and over and over again. And she had no military experience. So there was a lot of explaining um, because she just didn't understand. I mean, the language or how we, she really wanted she wanted to understand, but had no background. And so um, we took a deep dive into everything that happened. And then I remember at towards the end of it, I was done telling the story. And um, but in a way, it was probably pretty healing because I uh, got into like all these details about it. And um, and when you're telling someone new that doesn't understand it, the only people I had talked to prior to that were my husband, who was in the military, and my parents who had been in the military and people at work. So um, it probably was a good process. What was crazy is it took about two years, I think, for the book to come out. So that ended. I probably didn't tell that story again for a couple of years. And then when the book came out, I was, um, I had, for, I feel like I had forgotten a lot of what had happened. And so it was a reminder of a lot of the smaller details that maybe I'd put out of my mind or just moved on. So, um, but it's, it's neat to have the story in print, especially with all the detail, because I think as I get farther and farther away from it, the memory probably gets a little more cloudy. Um, and so it's it's nice that it's documented out there. It's an unusual story. So um, and people are always interested in it. And I don't mind telling the story. I don't I, I'm lucky that I didn't suffer from um, any effects or PTSD or anything. And so um, I always it, it's and I, I still find it to be an interesting story. And so I, I don't mind telling it. Mm. And, and for listeners, I'll add a, a link to the book, Band of Sisters, in the show notes if you want to, to check that out. It is interesting thinking of that as almost like this therapeutic process of having to go through slowly and translating it to someone with a different background and, and, and walk through that process yeah. multiple times and then even revisit it years later and seeing it in a different yep. way. That's, that's, that's uh, interesting. 
Um, yep, that's exactly the way well, it felt. Well, yeah. one of the many reasons I was very excited to connect with you is that um, you've talked about having had a rough transition from the military and, and throughout that process you've held a variety of very disparate jobs, a lobbyist, an entrepreneur, <laughs> and um, and then to all the way to finding your current career. And so I'd love to delve into that in a lot more detail, but maybe we can start by mm-hmm. just you know sharing what that process was like for you. It was long and complicated, and I wouldn't wish it on anybody. <laughs> and I'm, again, I want to go back to, like, to put things into perspective. I suffered from, I didn't have mental health issues or anything related to my time in the military. And it still was long and complicated. And um, so it always, you know, I always think about people that do come home with the wounds of war, whether they're visible or not. And that makes that transition so much harder. But someone who, who was fairly well adjusted and came back with no wounds of war, it's still, I just was completely unprepared for leaving the military. Completely. Because I went in, I did a college on an ROTC scholarship. So I knew when I graduated, I was going into the service. Um, and so I hadn't ever uh, done the things that my roommates were doing, like how to write a resume and how to interview for a job and all the stuff, the job prep stuff, because I knew I had a job when I was going to graduate. And then I spent eight years in the service. Um, and anyone that's been in the service knows that you have, you you know, these great amounts of responsibility at a young age and we do amazing things in the military, but then that does not translate in a resume to a civilian, um, in the civilian world at all. And um, at that point, I, I think there are better services now, but there is nothing to help me translate what I had done in the military to civilian speak. Um, but the other piece I think that was a really hard transition for me was the culture of the military. I mean, I loved the military. I loved serving. And the only reason I got out is because my husband and I wanted to have kids. Um, but I loved the Army. I grew up in the Army. I speak the language my personality was a good fit for it. But but in the civilian world, all those attributes that made me um, that that made me a, a high performer in the military made me a bull in a china shop in the in the civilian world. And so understanding um, <laughs> that you don't bark orders or, uh, you know, that just the, the, the language and the even my tone, the way I would speak, my husband would always say, you got to temper the way you're talking to people. And so I think you come out of the army, of, especially after two tours in Iraq in combat, and you're a warrior, and then you're supposed to put on a suit and fit into the civilian world and understand how HR works. And it, it was a not a smooth transition. And so I got rejected from a couple jobs, which were a terrible blow to my, um, maybe my ego, but my confidence. And so then I kind of did the reverse, and I started taking um, lower level jobs that that weren't satisfying, but I could get the job. <laughs> and so I just, I bounced around. I probably held in 13 years, I, it's um, maybe 15 jobs. <laughs> um, and there are all, I mean, it's ridiculous. At one point I even, um, I enrolled in auto mechanic school because I was going to be an auto mechanic and, and la- that lasted six months. And um, so there are, there are, I was a wedding planner. I installed flooring. I mean, it is all over the place, the jobs that I did. Um, and, and it just, it shouldn't have taken that long. I did the long story short is, um, it took me 13 years, but, um, I now have a job that I love. I'm extremely satisfied. I am excited to come to it every day. I have to force myself to go home at night. Um, I feel as fulfilled as I did when I was in the military. Um, I still have to temper my (laughs) tone of voice when I talk to people and I, I have to, uh, be a little more, um, not so probably aggressive or, um, I don't know what the words are, but uh, I, I, fitting into the civilian world is still not that easy. What, I mean, there's so much there I want to dive into. I love that. I, I'm wondering, first of all, um, so I'm thinking of people who are listening, who are maybe on active duty, or maybe they've been out for a little while, but I'm imagining there is a large number of people who hear you talking about your current job and the level that you're satisfied there and love that. And I, I bet there's a lot of people listening who say, I want that. That's what they're looking for. And um, yep. I'm just trying to dig into advice on how to find that. And and as I ask that, I'm a little bit torn because there is part of me that like still fantasizes there's some 
silver bullet or some way to maybe get there more efficiently. But there's also a part of me that in hearing your story of 13 years, there's part of me that thinks like, maybe that is the way that it's done. Maybe it is about dabbling. Maybe it's about trying wedding planning and realizing the aspects that you like and don't like, and then trying, you know, becoming, learning about becoming an auto mechanic and learning about that. Maybe maybe that's what the process looks like. And so I'm curious, like, what advice do you have for people about how to uncover what might light them up in the way that it clearly seems like you, you have in your current role? So that's a really good point because I do feel like every step took me to the next thing. It took me to the next thing. And by the time I found this job, um, I felt like everything I had done had prepared me for this job and it was the right one for me. But I also had the luxury of a husband that could pay our bills while I was figuring, doing all that. I don't know if you want to call it soul searching. Um, And most people don't have that luxury. And so I was allowed to take 13 years to figure it out. I think my husband probably wishes it took me half that time. (laughs) Um, And so, so that, you know, not everybody has that opportunity, I think. And it truthfully, it just shouldn't take that long when you've served your country, especially when you've served your country for eight years, and you've um, performed at a really high level, it there should be an it should not be hard to then figure out where that translate into the where that translates into the civilian world um and that's my only down my only di- real disappointment is now that I'm here it took me a long time and there's a lot of it just shouldn't have taken that long five years okay but 13 years is I mean it took me longer to find myself after the military than when I was than time I served in the military hmm. I I don't know though I mean the, the, I just I here's my the perspective I'm coming from is um, I feel like I know I honestly know very few people who who would say what you said when you talked about your job now with the Grand Junction economic partnership it's it's very clear that you really enjoy that. And there's not a lot of people I know that love what they're doing. And so there's part of me that's thinking like, ah, 13 years, maybe that's, maybe that's about right yeah. to find something. I, I'm wondering like if you, if you were to go, you know, if you were to go back, is there, is there something you would do differently? And I, I don't mean that from a sense of revisionist, but I'm just trying to think again of like teasing out a lesson for someone listening. Is there something that uh, a tool that they could have or a resource they could consider or a mindset shift that they could take that, that might help them find that faster? Well, I think I wish I had been better prepared. And I don't know if that's my fault for not paying attention when I was graduating from college or if the military had could have had better services for me. I because I I had embarrassingly bad interviews with big companies that hired um, veterans, uh, and I mean they were it's so I'm embarrassed thinking about it today how bad those interviews were because I was not prepared and I didn't know I mean there was an interview where I was asked something about HR and I didn't know what HR was which sounds silly today but 13 years ago I don't know if human resources was a I don't know but I, I just I so I do think that certain things like um, understanding what what jobs your skill set translate to. Someone could have, you know, having someone sit down and, and counsel me on that. Even putting, like, the translating the, the what we do in the military into civilian terms. Um, and then also understanding interviews and culture. I think the culture was the biggest thing. I came from an attack helicopter company where I was a commander, you know, and I had 30 guys. And being a woman, I probably... Um, had to be tougher than than even a lot of men did had to be and so that does not translate well <laughs> into the civilian world at all and so i just think understanding civilian culture i just think there could have been some sort of process to sit me down and walk me through what this transition would look like um and and there wasn't uh and i was an officer i got out as a captain and i just think of um enlisted ranks, you know, that's, I think that transition would be even harder. um, And just think that people, there could have been some help, Mm -hmm. I think, or I should have maybe, and maybe it exists and I didn't ask for it. I don't, you know, it was a long time ago, but um, I think my first couple of years, my husband jokingly refers to it as my dark period. Um, But it, those, the first two years were probably the worst only because I wasn't finding anything. And then I started just taking anything, which actually was, kind of fun but not very satisfying in the long run um and then i then there was a point where i realized i 
had loved serving my country, and so how could I serve my community? And so I definitely was looking at um, at ways to like, the nonprofit world and, and jobs that, that gave back to the community. And that's when I think things started to go, uh, things, I got on a track that led to the job I'm in today is when I definitely narrowed down that I wanted to give back to my community the way I had, you know, serve my community the way I'd served the military um, and so that, but that probably took me five years to come to that conclusion. <laughs> mm. I, you know, three things I'll just kind of point out for listeners too is, um, first of all, in the 250 plus interviews I've done so far, what Robin is saying is by far the, um, uh, the rule, not the exception. Like the vast majority of people I talk to, the first couple of years of that transition is rough. And a lot of it has to do around identity and this sense of purpose that it's, it sounds like Robin, you know, found later down yep. the road, but it's like, I, I think most of us under us or most people I've uh, interviewed myself included, um, we underestimate the shift in identity and the, yeah. the, the missingness of that purpose that, that happens. It's almost like the, the rug being pulled on, out from under you. Cause you don't, even know to expect that. And so I really, That's exactly right. Yeah. And I respect and appreciate the way in which and the openness with which Robin is talking about that, because it is definitely a norm, but I think she's really um, describing it in a way that's hopefully valuable for listeners. Cause I think she's, she's really putting her, the, the uh, hitting the nail on the head about what that feels like. And it's almost like, uh, you know, the sense I had when you were talking, it's like, you know, when the ground slips out underneath you and you're, you're weightless there and you're kind of scrambling, it's almost like that sense of like, whoa, this is such a big shift. And it's like that, that sense of panic. And um, yeah, the other thing too, and I, I, you know, this is just my own personal perspective, but um, I, I think, you know, sometimes I view these things of like, man, again, not to harp on this too much, but it's like, you know, you talk about five years of taking to learn that, okay, you really wanted, and I thought it was beautiful the way you put it from moving from serving your country to serving your community. And so you take five years to realize you have this aha moment. It sounds like where it's like, that yeah. is something that lights me up. And and I would just say for listeners, like, man, if you, if you spend five years and you come to a, what I view as a life-changing realization like that, Five years well spent. You know, those sorts of epiphanies don't come mm-hmm. along a lot. And and so maybe maybe with that, could we talk a little bit about, you know, what what is your current role look like? And I'd love to learn about like what is it that gets you so excited about it? So my so I am I work for the Economic Development Agency for Mesa County, which is the largest Grand Junction is the largest metropolitan area in western Colorado or west of the Rockies. Most people think of Colorado as Denver. That's on the Front Range, east of the Rockies. And um, so in our so it's a it's a population of about 150,000 people, three towns, and. Um, those municipalities all pay us to be their economic development agency. And what that primarily means is we recruit new business into town and we help grow local businesses. And the whole point is to create primary jobs. And so those are good paying jobs that are above the average annual wage for our county. So increasing that um, average annual wage, what people are making, um, and then growing those types of jobs in the area so that we have a diversified and really strong economy. Grand Junction is particularly interesting because for decades we've relied on one industry and that's oil and gas and um after 2008 uh we went into this huge bust and um the economy just was it really tanked we lost 8000 jobs it was devastating and at the same time we watched denver which is 4 hours away begin to explode and at times was the hottest market the fastest growing market in the country and so um, we came to the, our leadership across the valley came to the conclusion that we had to diversify our economy and do things differently. And so then became a real strategic effort um, coordinating all of our municipalities and the, the business leadership and our elected leadership to um, help to, to recruit other industries and to grow other industries like tech, outdoor rec manufacturing. Um, and so it's really very, uh, what I find satisfying is one, you're working with a large group of stakeholders. And so convening people and getting people to work together. um, So that's very similar to the military. And then um, it's a lot of problem solving. So 
looking at manufacturing. We have a pretty robust manufacturing industry here. And so how can we help grow manufacturing? And so we reach out to our manufacturers and find out what, you know, what's good about doing business here, what's bad. And then we, we, when you hear the same things over and over again, you realize, you know, especially if, you know, we have trouble hiring this kind of person and you hear that from three business owners, then we figure out how do we get more of those type of people in the Valley. And so every day is different. Um, I love where I live. So Western Colorado is a wonderful place to live. And so most of what I do is promote where I live. Um, and so it, that part's easy because we live here for a reason. We spend a lot of time outdoors. It's really beautiful. Um, and so then just helping to create a really business friendly environment for those companies that we are trying to recruit here. And it's been really satisfying. Our economy is improving. We're diversifying. We're adding jobs in lots of sectors. Um, the average annual wage is going up. And we have a lot of poverty in this part of the state. And so um, the two numbers I like to look at is the average annual wage and the number of kids in our school district that are on free and reduced lunch. So hopefully as one of those numbers goes up, the other number goes down. Um, and so it's, it is, um, as you can see, as you know, it's very, um, it's satisfying to come to work. I feel good about it, what we do. We're making this place a better place for future generations to grow up. That's great. And um, just for Listeners, again, when, when, you know, the three things that struck me from what Robin was describing is um, it, it seems to me it, that, that three things that have made her really happy in her role is, is definitely that sense of contribution of giving back to the community and, and doing a thing that's having a major impact on families and people and, and a, a whole area of the world. And, you know, a second piece is um, I'm, I'm betting there's a lot of growth in this role because as you describe that, uh, that challenge of bringing about uh -huh. a major economic area. There's, there's this part of me that's like, oh man, that's, that is extremely daunting. Like the amount of work that you would have to do to achieve that is, is not a trivial undertaking. So I'm also imagining there's a fair amount of, um, challenge in your job that's causing you to grow and learn and your team to grow and learn and adapt. And so I, yep. I can imagine that being really fulfilling. And then the, the other third, the third piece that came through from that too, is you talked about, you know, I, I'm in, um, as we we're talking about before, Robin, I'm, I'm over in Denver. I love Colorado. And um, you, you talked about the lifestyle that you and your husband and your kids, you're able to be outdoors and you're able to have access to nature and skiing and all these great things. And I just want to call all three things out of those things out for listeners is those are all really valid criteria to look at a job for. Like, can you find a job yep. that allows you to contribute, a job that allows you to grow and feel fulfilled? And in Robin's case, a job that matches your lifestyle, which is, you know, I'm in that same bucket. One of the reasons Rebecca and I moved to Colorado is like we wanted to spend more time in nature and outdoors. And therefore, that was one of our criteria in moving. And I think those are just valuable levers to play with as you're thinking of what you're looking for. Yeah, absolutely. That you nailed it. What so. about? Um, I, I wanted to circle back. You talked about kind of communication changes and cultural changes, and you, you already spoke a little bit about this. But what else would you want listeners to know? Because again, I don't think you're unique in this. I think that a lot of guests I've had on the show have have maybe touched on that briefly. Of there needs to be a shift in the way that they interact with their colleagues and the way that they communicate and the the way that they show up. Um, for someone who's on active duty right now, how would you explain this to them, or or what? What do they not know that they need to know, or what's a way that they can start to be a little bit aware of that? Um, well, the first thing is you have to be because you have to be really careful who you um, give a hard time to, and I mean that in like when you're joking around because in the military, you know, everyone sits around and just makes fun of each other, and you're constantly ribbing each other, and it's part of the culture, and it's something I enjoyed and made me I laughed really hard. I mean, I laughed harder for long periods of time when I was deployed with my soldiers than probably ever again. And, um, but when you go out to the civilian world and you start teasing people and giving people a hard time, they don't always, people don't have the same sense of humor. So that, you know, is, I say that lightheartedly, but, um, you, you do have to be careful in, in how you tease people because not everyone, people just don't get that. That aside, um, I think probably the biggest, uh, thing I had to learn was just to temper, uh, temper my personality in group meetings. And uh, I don't have to go after everything with a baseball bat. Um, and there is, I think people still probably, if you asked people I work with, they consider me very direct and, um, and maybe a, a little 
overbearing sometimes, but that has, I have backed off big time um, on not being, um, not monopolizing conversations and not having to get my way and all of these things that when you're a commander, at least in the military and, and, you know, you work with, obviously you work with your team in the military and you, you, you create mission planning and all the things that you do with a team. You don't do that single-handedly, but um, I think that just the tone and the way we talk to people and communicate uh, is softer. And um, like even in emails, I always have to end with like, I have to make a point to, my emails even sometimes come across as too direct and I have to say, have a great day. <laughs> or, <laughs> or or like may, like even put like a hope all is well. So it doesn't come across as, hey, I need this right now. Can you, or I need this by Tuesday or can you do this? So I don't know. I, I think it's just tempering personality wise. I will say that one of the things I enjoy most is I have um, four employees in my organization and I love working with my team and they are great. I've two were already in the organization two I've hired and that has just been really fun to cultivate the team again and to feel again like going back to my company commander days. Um, what are everybody's strengths and how does everyone contribute and um, delegating what needs to be done and, and just creating a culture that people like to come to work and, and people look forward to the, the, the mission of the day and what we're going to do. And that I have enjoyed very much. I love that. I, I, um, I work with a coach and one of the things I'm working on right now is, is my ability to finesse is the, the word that resonates with me. And I, I, what you're saying resonates a lot where I, I kind of go in a straight line and I kind of just go straight for something and learning to try and kind of, like you said, massage it and kind of soften yeah. a little bit. And, you know, it is far more efficient the way that I do things, which is just go in right for what needs to be done. Yeah. But there is also, yeah. it's in the grand scheme of things, it's not actually efficient because if that rubs someone the wrong <laughs> way or if someone doesn't re respond yeah. to that, then it's going to take more time. So it's almost like retraining myself to, um, you know, just the little mm -hmm. things like you talked about. I love that. Like just, hey, I hope your day is going well. Like the, you know, I'm like this in meetings too. Like I, I go into a, a room for a meeting and it's like right yeah. in and it's like, it's like retraining. Yep. It's like, okay. Uh, it's like almost like, okay, I need five minutes <laughs> of chit chat and I need to go in knowing yeah. that that's not a waste that that five minute of chit chat is letting people settle in. And therefore, if I'd spend five to 10 minutes doing that, I haven't lost five to 10 minutes of a meeting. It'll ultimately make things more productive. So it, it's just, uh, yep. it is, it, there's, there's a lot of um, truth in what you're saying. Um, and, and I also wanted to touch on, um, cause you are this Swiss army knife of different, uh, different cool things to dig into. You, mm -hmm. um, you went with, um, Stacy bear and Matt Griffin, you travel back to Iraq. Um, you go there, uh, instead of with a helicopter, you go there with skis and you were, yep. uh, joined by a documentary film crew who produces this movie adventure, not war. What was that process like? And, and what was the motivation for you to take part in it? So the process was amazing, and um, it's probably one of the greatest gifts I've been given, uh, mostly because I think I carried uh, the weight of the Iraq war on my shoulders and all of my friends that I lost over there, and I just thought Iraq was this horrible, horrible place. I would never, I mean, in a million years, I never thought I'd step foot, foot back in that country. Um, I thought the people were terrible people just because I didn't know the difference. And from my perspective, um, when I was there uh, during two different deployments, I just assumed everybody wanted to kill me. So I had just um, I, I also have a, a unique circumstance where two weeks after I was shot down, there was one other female commander, which in itself is unusual, um, who was shot down in the exact same place at the same time of day. And she was killed. And so I carried a ton of guilt because of that, because the parallels were awfully close. And I, you know, in my mind for a long time, I thought that I was, I should have died the day I was shot down. And because I didn't, Kimberly had to die. And so, um, you know, it does, it's not rational, but it's the crazy things you think. And so carrying that with me. And so I just, it was this big black hole was um, my experience in Iraq. And so when Stacy called me up and said, um, hey, do you want to go skiing in Iraq? <laughs> my absolute first response was not only no, but hell no. I would, what do you, <laughs> why would I go back there? Um, and he started explaining it to me and I got it, but I still thought I was lucky enough to get out of that country twice alive. And now I'm a mom and a, a big part of me felt it would be irresponsible to go back. Um, and then the more I just dug into 
the opportunity. I actually called uh, my friend Kimberly Hampton, who was killed. I called her mother because she had actually traveled to um, Kurdistan uh, three or four times to meet with gold star mothers in Iraq. And um, so I called her and said, what do you think? And she said, you need to go. It'll be an amazing opportunity. And so, and my husband said, you need to go. And, um, and, you know, I was leaving for two weeks. And at that time, my kids were like seven and 10. Um, so it was a heavy decision to make, but once I made it, I did not look back. And um, Stacy is, I, did you, have you interviewed Stacy? No, not yet, but I guess that's oh, our next person. He's like, <laughs> he's like, he's one of the funniest people you will ever meet. So that certainly made the trip a lot of fun. <laughs> I mean, he's hilarious. And um, he's also a, a giant. He's like six, seven. And um, he's a monster of a person. And I'm very small. I'm five, three. So that was really entertaining, I think. <clears throat> so, um, so anyway, it was, it was amazing. So we went to Iraq. Uh, the day that we flew into Mosul was the day that um, it was in like February of 2017 when there was the offensive to take back um, uh, the day we flew in. I'm sorry. Um, Erbil, Iraq is 40 miles from Mosul. And that was the day that was the offensive to take back Mosul from ISIS. And so as we're flying into Erbil, that's happening 40 miles away. And that's when I thought, what the heck have I done? <laughs> um, but Kurdistan was amazing. And uh, it totally changed my perspective on the war and why we were there. And um the Kurdish people. So it was very safe. I felt safe the whole time we were there. Kurdistan has its own unrecognized border. It has its own military. Um, and I at no point felt, I mean, I, I could, I would feel safe taking my children there. The people were also incredibly friendly. The food was fantastic. We ate so well. Um, and then we stayed with a uh, tour guide in Kurdistan. We stayed at his home with his family and they were wonderful to us. And then of course we had the amazing opportunity. We climbed and skied the tallest mountain in Iraq, which is Halgard, Mount Halgard. And it's a first ascent, which was really exciting. Um, and so that uh, was a pretty awesome opportunity as well. A little bit scary. I'm not, I, I ski, but I'm a weekend warrior, not a, I'm, I don't go out and scale, get first ascent and <laughs> scale large mountains. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but it was, a uh, it was awesome. And so I think, um, when you've climbed the highest mountain, uh, in the country where you had your lowest lows, it just, uh, something changes. And so I left all that guilt and all the weight and all the darkness that from my, 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 that I had experienced in Iraq on top of that mountain and came home much lighter and feeling much better about, um, everything we'd done in Iraq and the reason we were there and the losses that we experienced. That's beautiful. I, I I really have loved for the last 10 years this concept of reclaiming. And um, I, I did this with a, a friend of mine who died in a car crash near Big Sur. I, I ran like organized run for um, in Big Sur. And the thought was, you know, you have a location or, or anything that, that's tied to a lot of sadness or trauma or whatever it may be. And, mm -hmm. and, it, and, it, and it taints that name and location, all of that. And there's this thought of, of reclaiming it, of like, doing something to take back the meaning of it, to, to assign your own meaning to that. And that's, so that's kind of the story that I create when, when you talk about this is you were really reclaiming Iraq. You were going to the yep. spot where you had stories about the people and the culture and the place. And you were, you were literally rewiring your brain around this and having these yep. incredible, just, I mean, absolutely unbelievable experiences and in, and in doing so assigning a new meaning to it. It's, it's, I love that there's just such an empowering sense that I get from that. Yep. Mm. And I think Stacy said it best when he said, when he called me and he said, we're going to rewrite the ending of that story. And mm. so that's exactly what we did. Mm. And um, again, it's one of those things where it was really expensive to go and we had sponsors, we didn't have to pay. And I will say the per, I mean, we got all this North face was in a, a sponsor and we got all this great gear. It was really, <laughs> that part was really <laughs> fun, but, um, but the logistics and everything it was, it was difficult, but I always, I, you know, it's too bad that, um, that everybody, every veteran can't go back and experience what I experienced because it was very healing. And, um, I was definitely a better person, uh, when I came back from that trip than when I left. That's great. So. And then one other area, I know, I know we're starting to run out of time, but, um, 
you have uh, you, you had your own publishing co- you have your own co- publishing company called Brown House Public Relations, and you also at one point published your own magazine, spoke uh, spoke yep. spoke and Blossom magazine, or is it Spoke Plus Blossom magazine? Um, spoke and Blossom. Yep. Spoke and Blossom. Yep. Um, what would you want listeners to know about this? What was this like getting into publishing? And yeah, anything you'd want to share with listeners about that? So I think that. Um... The important part of that story is that was one more step leading to the job I had today. So I kept, so I was, I, and I won't go through the, we probably don't have time for all the details, but I, I held a position. I was development director for a historic theater um, renovation here. And then, you know, I recognized a hole that existed in the community and it had to do with event management. So I moved into the down, I was the event director for our downtown. And then I recognized a hole and it was promotion of our quality of life beyond where we live. And and primarily our biggest tourist uh, destination, people where people are coming from is Denver. And we just weren't doing a good job of telling how awesome this place was to the Denver market. And so then um, I opened the public relations company and that was to promote um, Western Colorado, outside of Western Colorado. And again, recognized a whole, and that was that we didn't have a tool. And I had wonderful clients who paid me to do that, but it still wasn't enough. And so at that point, I thought the only way to tell these stories and to put out all the good stuff happening here in our community is to launch a lifestyle magazine, which we didn't have, a regional lifestyle magazine. And so I launched the magazine. And, it, and so I, all of these steps, it was... One, I was willing to do a lot of different things that, and in a smaller town, you wear lots of hats. Um, And so I was willing to take on jobs that maybe I wasn't necessarily qualified to do, but I knew I could figure it out. And so every time I recognized or, or identified a gap or something that wasn't happening, I was able to fill that. And then ultimately, when this position came open, um, and if you had told me five years ago that I'd be running our, the Economic Development Agency for Western Colorado, I would have laughed at you. But it came open and my phone started ringing and people in the community said, you should apply for that job. A lot of people said that, which was very humbling, but also surprising. And I would explain, well, I don't know anything about economic development and all the, you know, people would say, well, you don't, you can learn that stuff. It's the passion for the community and the problem solving that we really need in that position. And so I ended up getting the job, which was really awesome. And, um, and they were right. I've, I can, I've figured out over the last, so now I've been in my job since December of, uh, 17, so a little over a year. And the economic development stuff, that's right. You can learn all that stuff. It's the passion, the problem solving, the working with people, um, all the stuff that all of those jobs, including the magazine, um, which was a lot of storytelling. Um, and that's what we, since we're recruiting new companies into the area, we're selling the community and talk, you know, highlighting all the our strengths. That's what I did with the magazine. So it was a perfect fit. So one thing led to another Um, led to another and ultimately got me to where I am today. But if I had five years ago tried to draw that line, I would never have been able to end up (laughs) at this point. I I love that sense too of kind of... um... You know, you, you said at one point t- taking a job that you thought you you were never qualified for, and I love that sense of just taking on something like this and and the amount you have to grow and learn as as part of that. And it seems like it was a really tremendous experience. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, so, I I know that we're. Um, well, and I think and you know, oh, the yep. one thing I'll add to that is, and that is something that I think is really unique to people coming out of the military is, in the military you're you know you have to accomplish this mission and you have to figure it out and so i think that we are trained coming out to like really think outside the box and just get get it done and um and so i think when you apply that outside of that it it's a real advantage to when you realize i'm capable of doing this job i don't i don't have the you know i don't have the tools i don't understand the actual the tools of that like economic development tools i didn't really understand what those were i knew i could figure it out and learn it and i knew i was capable of doing it and so i think that that's an important thing that we can take away from the military is the strength in the military is you you get shit done um and so that's a that is something that is lacking i think in the civilian world and where veterans can really prove themselves totally agree totally agree i mean my my own path has been in entrepreneurship and um Went, went to business school and that was a great help. But when I look back on everything that's made me successful or relatively successful in entrepreneurship, it's I attribute almost all of it to the military and exactly what you said, the ability to yep. get shit done, to break through walls, to figure it out. And um, that's, I, I hope for listeners, like I, what I have appreciated the most in my conversation with Robin is is her authenticity and just honesty of 
emotions that we all face in this transition. And um, I think that it's, you know, hopefully you take that away, that, that awareness that this is something that many, and if not all veterans face, but I hope you also equally take with what what she just said that that sense of empowerment of you know you have you can learn you can learn the stuff we're talking about you can learn to couch your emails you can learn to chit chat in meetings you can learn to soften your language that's the easy stuff but what you learned in that crucible experience in the military of being able to get anything done that's a lot yeah. harder for people to learn that's like that's you, you've gotten yeah. the, the, the the trickiest stuff out of the way and now you know back to what my coach said it's, it's about the finesse it's about the little uh, icing on the top to be able to package this together and, and make something beautiful out of it. Yep. Um, yeah. Well, Robin, I know that we're um, just about out of time, but I always like to leave the last question open-ended, and that is um, you've shared a lot with listeners. It's been um, really fantastic advice, and I'm sure there's stuff that we didn't cover that um, you, you may want to share. And so knowing that you have people on active duty and people who are um, have transitioned recently. Is there any last words of wisdom or advice that you'd like to leave with them with? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I, I guess the, the biggest, I think I already said it is if you, um, you know what you're capable of. And I, again, I come back to like, we did amazing things when we were in the service and, um, and, and, and most people have not experienced those things or accomplished things that great. And so have confidence in yourself that you can accomplish whatever it is that's in front of you. You can. It took me 13 years. It shouldn't take anyone longer <laughs> to find your, your place in the world. And it doesn't have to be a, a job that I think a lot of people don't have to. Um, a lot of people are very happy and content in their lives not working for a nonprofit. <laughs> um, there's a lot of, of things out there that, that satisfy us. But I would say um, uh, keep, keep searching until you find that thing that does. That's awesome. Well, for listeners in the show notes at the at beyondtheuniform.org, you will find um, a lot more information. You'll find a link to the book that talks about her experience, Band of Sisters. You'll find a link to her documentary, Adventure Not War. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Robin. I really appreciate it. Beyond the Uniform is written and produced by me, Justin Asiri, with help from our Chief of Staff, Steve Bain, and our editor, Kathleen Dillon. We are an all-volunteer organization and would greatly appreciate your help in any of the following ways. First, spread the word. Beyond the Uniform has over 330 podcast episodes and 15 on-demand webinars, all offered for free. Help us spread the word on social media, at military bases, or whatever gets this resource in front of more men and women who need it. Positive reviews on iTunes go a long way towards this as well. Second, sponsorship. Beyond the Uniform relies on sponsorship to keep us going. There is so much more we'd like to do, but we don't have nearly the resources to do so. If you know of a company that would like to advertise in any way with Beyond the Uniform, please send them to beyondtheuniform.org. Third, donations. If you're in a financial position to donate, you can find more information on the support section of beyondtheuniform.org. At our website, beyondtheuniform.org, you'll also find 330-plus episodes categorized by industry, functional role, and more. You'll find a link for live events, typically four per month. You'll also find both free and for-purchase books that take a deeper dive on topics related to career growth. Thank you for your support as we aim to help members of the military and their families thrive in their post-military career and life. 